Hello, welcome back to Following to Lead with Kevin East. As always, I'm still Kevin East. Glad you're here on this podcast with me again today. As always, I hope to inspire you to follow Jesus in such a way that it changes you, changes the way that you live and the way that you lead, both at work and at home. And so each episode on this podcast, that's what we talk about. We're following Jesus, so we're learning from somebody's example as they follow the example of Christ. Today I get to talk to a new friend, a guy named Michael Pink, down in beautiful Florida. And uh, this guy, I'm telling you what, if you're involved in business, in sales, um, in the business world in general, this guy had more passion in his pinky than probably most people interact with. Um, I said pinky. His last name's Pink. That's pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, as we talked about um, him researching God's Word for how we can really learn in wisdom to, to interact in the business world, it's fascinating to hear how he went from learning how to sell a copier to becoming like an amazing copier salesman. I didn't even talk about his whole real estate background. He took a real estate company from a fledgling organization that had three real estate agents to the 16th fastest growing company on the, uh, on the Indy 500 list back in 20, 2018, I guess it was. We didn't even get into that. We talked about just learning from Moses and some principles um, that they, he gleaned from that and out of Proverbs 3. So if you're involved in business and sales and you say, Lord, what would it look like for, for me to be aware of the kingdom in the marketplace? I think you'd enjoy this conversation. So here it is, my conversation again with Michael Pink. Well, Michael, finally, uh, it's great to finally connect with you and be connected to you here in this, in this interview setting. Thanks for taking a few minutes to be on the podcast today. Yeah, sure. Glad to be with you, Kevin. It's an honor. I mean, you are in sunny Florida. I'm here in, in East Texas, and so I'm a little bit envious because I bet the weather there is very nice. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is. I don't want to tell you how nice it is, but it is about perfect. So it's Oh, I bet. Yeah. I bet. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you're on the podcast today. I love talking to people about how faith in Jesus really intersects the marketplace specifically. And I know, man, as I read about you uh, and read up, up on you, it's one of the things I've seen that that's been true in your life. I want to start, I've read this about you, that you're a pioneer of the application of biblical strategy and natural law to sales, to sales and business. Would you talk about, I mean, obviously you're the pioneer, so you must know what that means, but talk about that intersection, if you would, and help us, uh, help us understand a little bit what that means. Well, sure. If you're talking about the intersection of biblical wisdom and natural law or the intersection of that and business, which is Ooh, you... both, <laughs> <laughs> whichever you prefer. But I really mean both there, how they how those two things intersect and then how they impact, you know, business as, as well. Sure. Well, first of all, uh, Paul says in Romans one twenty that the hidden things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen being revealed by the things he made, even his eternal power and divine nature. And we know that in 1 Kings 4.33 that Solomon, it says that he spoke about a number of things, about trees, from the hyssop that springs out of the wall to the cedars of Lebanon. And it says that the kings of the earth sent their emissaries to listen to his wisdom. They wanted to know what he knew about, for example, trees. Now, hmm. they didn't come to learn how to prune a pear tree. He had an understanding of some of the processes and he actually, in one year, the Bible records, if you put it in today's economy, he received about a billion dollars in consulting fees, and the fee was set by the person getting the wisdom. In other words, they said, that's very valuable. Here you go. And in one year, it was 666 yeah. talents of gold. You do the math, it's a well over a billion dollars in today's money. And so he knew a few things. And so I know that God made the system, so I study both his word and the systems that he made. So, for example, when it ties it into business, let me do that. A tree is the most successful business model on the planet. If you take 100 saplings and you put them in an orchard and come back in five years, you're going to have 100 fruit trees that are all bearing fruit and very successful. But if you take 100 young entrepreneurs and say, go start a business and come back in five years, only four of them will have done this. They will still be in business, have at least one employee, so they're a business, and be making a profit. Four out of 100 versus 100 out of 100. So what, does, what did God put into, embed into the systems that he created within the tree, and how does it work? And so I've studied that out for decades just to learn that, and I interpret it through two ways. I, I, I took trips down to the Smithsonian World Headquarters for tropical research in the Panama Canal. I've been to the rainforest multiple times, five times I think it was in Panama, been to the upper Amazon, always to study how God did his incredible things. Because, for example, the rainforest is the most productive, diverse system on the planet. 
And so when I first discovered that, I thought, wow, there must be, the soil must be very rich. It must be wonderful. But it's not. It's very shallow and poor quality because the rain kind of washes it away. It leaches it out. So the question was, well, God, how do you get abundance from scarcity? And that's what every business owner mm. needs to know. So that caught me studying that. Well, then when I see certain processes, I say, well, what does that equal in the scripture? So, for example, it needs water. Well, what is water in the scripture? And that's how I interpret it. In the scripture, the water is compared to the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Ephesians 5 talks about the washing of the water of the word. So I can see in an analogy perspective that water is compared to information or knowledge. Okay, so what is the role of information in a successful business? And I, I just go down that path of wow. studying both, both those things out, the natural law, and I interpret it from the scripture. And I spent a <clears throat> tremendous amount of time in the scripture because... A lot of people, when they look in the Bible as a Christian, okay, they love Jesus, but they've never looked at the Bible and said, can this teach me beyond the basics of be honest, be diligent, work hard, those kind of things. Can I get more from the scripture than that? And they usually don't look at the Bible in that way, but I do. So for example, um, one, one of the strategies that I've taught all over the world was found in Numbers 13. In Numbers 13, we see the story where the, Moses sends the 12 spies into the promised land and he sends them out wanting seven questions answered. When I noticed there were seven questions, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's something here. There's always something significant to sevens in the Bible. So I stopped and spent probably two days on my knees, in my office, at my desk, on the floor, wherever I needed to be praying and saying, God, what does this mean? What are the what's the implication and what's the application to business? Because they knew they were going to be met with resistance which meant there would be risk, but if successful, there would be reward. Now think about that. That's business. Resistance, risk, reward. We deal with resistance. You've got competition. You've got people's ideas, whatever. There's risk. i got to risk my time, my capital, my efforts, my emotions, all that kind of stuff. But if I'm successful, there's a reward. So knowing that that's a parallel, what does the Bible say? What did Moses want to find out? And then I, like I say I spent a couple of days studying that out. And I thought I had it kind of figured out. Coincidentally, a client of mine said, hey, Michael, uh, I'm going to be calling on a, con on a contractor we've been calling on for six years. We call on him twice a month, like clockwork, never miss. Brought him and his crew breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But in six years, I haven't got a nickel's worth of business. What would you recommend? And I said, I've got seven questions I want you to ask him. He thought that was a little strange. And he said, well, <laughs> and I said, they're not really questions. They're topics. See, Moses said, see the land, what it is. He wanted to know the lay of the land, which, by the way, Sun Tzu and people like that know, wanted to know the lay of the land. Is it box canyons? Is it desert? Is it marshes? Is it boggy? Is it fertile? All those kinds of things. He wanted to know whether the people are strong or weak. Are they few or many? Do they live in tents or strongholds? Is there any wood there? They had seven very important questions. And so under each one of those questions, I, I said, basically, here's what this means. Here's some circumstantial questions you could ask. Here's questions you can ask about the their current vendors, their current suppliers. Here's questions you can ask that help you know whether they're thinking short-term or long-term. In other words, are they living in tents or are they living in strongholds, fortified cities? And there's a whole lot there. And I never told him it was from Moses. I never gave him that context at that point. And he went on his call that he'd been going on twice a month for six years. He went on a Wednesday, I believe it was. And he said, you know, Michael, I've been to this guy's house for dinner. He's been at my home, but we just don't have any business. They ask these questions. This is important. It's not that they're magical or some kind of crazy thing like that. It's they're strategic. You have to know this was a strategic thing when they were going to go into Canaan. So I'm thinking strategy, wisdom. I got to figure this out. And so he went in and asked these questions and opened up things he'd never seen in six years because they usually talk about the sports team, your family, and all those good things. In the South, they call it a good old boy. And they're good old boys and they're all, you know, friendly with each other but not getting any business. This is the first time he asked these kind of questions. So on Thursday, the, the gentleman asked for a purchase, uh, asked for a, a quote. And on Friday, my client got a purchase order for $60,000. He was stunned. He called an emergency sales meeting, put me in front of 18 of his salespeople who cover Tennessee, Alabama, and Arkansas, I believe it was. And he, and he said, teach them. He didn't know where it was. And he held up the piece of paper that I'd written for him. And he said, I don't know what this is. And I don't know why it works, but I want every one of you doing it. Now, just so you understand, that wasn't a lucky thing that happened to him. The, this was the end of March. 
The preceding April, they'd done 1.2 million in revenue. They were hoping to do 1.3 in the upcoming one. And there I am just a few days before April teaching them. And he made a requirement that they follow this process. They did. Hmm. And at the end of April, I asked him, how did it turn out? And instead of doing 1.2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 or 7, they did 1.7 and a half million. Wow. I saw him in the hall. I said, how did it go? And he told me his face was just ashen. He's like, he was bewildered. Like, what, what is this that you did? He said, where did you learn that? He's wanting to know if I got it from Zig Ziglar or some other, you know, leader. I said, well, actually, I learned it from Moses. <laughs> He would have been less surprised about a cold cough. Okay. In Following Talid, we talk about following Jesus each week. And as we follow Jesus, how it changes us, the way that we live and the way that we lead. It's what I say each time as I open up this podcast. It's one thing to talk about it. It's something completely different to live it out. So I want to tell you about this ministry I get to lead called Mentoring Alliance. Mentoring Alliance is a Christ-centered ministry that supports children and families in the communities that we have the privilege of serving. We say it like this here, that we exist to mobilize godly people into the lives of kids and families to provide tangible help and eternal hope. We do summer camps, after school programs, and we connect godly people as mentors one-on-one -on -one with at-risk kids in these communities. You know, if you're passionate about helping kids and families from all different parts of communities, I'd invite you to join us here at Mentoring Alliance. You can find us at thementoringalliance.com. If you'd be willing to help support it financially, that would be great as well. You can do that at thementoringalliance.com slash donate. Again, that's thementoringalliance slash donate. So let me, let me ask you this then, Michael. I mean, because I'm sure people listening, especially those involved in business, are like, now, hold on a second. Like, I mean, even as you point out seven questions were asked, I'm like, you know what? I know the significance of seven in Scripture. I've never thought about the fact that when I read that, these seven questions, like, I need to really pay attention because there's seven here. How did you translate that from Numbers 13 into the present-day reality of this guy with sales? What did that look like, the translation look like then? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I'll, I'll tell you, this is where a lot of Christians miss it in my opinion, and that's not an accusation. It's, it would have been true of me as well. Yeah. Is, yeah. is you're not used to looking at it that way and you're not used to spending the time that it yeah. takes, or at least it took me. I spent two days on four verses hmm. saying, God, what, help me. What, what's going on here? What's Moses facing? Why did he want to know these questions? How does that translate? Let me give you another example that ties to this. When I first moved to this country from Canada, I got a job selling copiers. I'd sold copiers before in Toronto, and I didn't do terribly well. I didn't want to sell copiers ever, ever again. But as I was driving down I-40, the Holy Spirit just said, Michael, that's where you're going to work. And I looked at that building. And I said, oh, copiers, Lord, I don't want to do that, but okay. <laughs> and, and I went and applied, and they said, we've already filled the position, but if you're willing to work out on Murfreesboro, you know, we'll, we'll do it. So fair enough. They told me on my first day, you know, this is answering your question. They said, um, Michael, we already knew this, but we expect in your, that you, for every four or five companies that you demonstrate to, uh, you should make one sale. The national average is one out of four. Okay. And we don't expect any sales your first month, but we want two sales your second month and four sales a month thereafter. I went home, my wife said, what's bugging you? I said, honey, they're asking me to sell one out of four. She said, so what's the problem? I said, well, that means they're asking me to accept a 75% failure rate. And I said, what farmer plants four rows of corn and prays to God that only one of them comes up? And I picked up my Bible. This was the turning point, Kevin. This was the turning point. Hmm. I picked up my Bible, and I said, I'm going to find principles and strategies that I can apply to my work. If God called me to sell the copiers and put me in this job, then I need him to show me how to do this. I'd already been trained by Xerox. I already knew the way it was done. I wanted to learn his ways. And so I said, I'm going to find that. And instead of selling one out of four, I intend to sell one out of one. My branch manager, when I went to report to him, he said, what are your goals? I told him he thought I was nuts, but they already printed my cards. I'm on straight commission, so away you go. 90 days later, Kevin, 90 days later, all the salespeople are called into a meeting from all the branches. You have to stand up in front of your peers, put your results behind you on an overhead projector and say, I made X number of calls, X number of demos, X number of sales, and X number of dollars. When it came my turn, I said, I've been here 90 days. Remember, they wanted me to make six sales in 90 days. I didn't see anybody do that ever, but that was the goal. And I said, I've been here 90 days. Um, I've done X number of calls, got 22 demos, and I'm pleased to report that I also have uh, 22 sales. 
and you they were just in, the room erupted like what who yeah. is this guy and then they started pelting me with questions and as i answered them um one of the guys at the back, I jokingly referred to him as the former number one sales guy, said, all we need is some evangelist from Canada to tell us how to sell copiers. But you see, how that happened was it began with Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, verse 3 and 4 says, to bind mercy and truth around your neck, write them upon the tablet of your heart, and you will find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and the sight of man. I thought, I need favor. I'm not that good at sales. I need it when it comes down to me or the other guy that somehow... I have favor with this guy and that maybe somehow God, however he does what he does, he gives me favor. I want that. So I said, how do you bind mercy and truth around your neck? It's not enough to read it. Stop. Hmm. What does that mean? And I said, God, what do you, hmm. what, what, I, I go to the Christian bookstore. Can I get some mercy for my neck or some truth? No. Can I, how do I write it on my heart? How, how do you do that? Well, so you have to think these things through and pray about it. So for me, mercy meant for one, never ever again trying to make a sale to somebody that it wasn't in their best interest. So if if it's not in your best interest, I'm not going to do a demo. And in order for me to find out, I had to ask questions. And then I had to ask the right questions, which then helped me understand the opportunity, and then I could make a presentation and close the sale. And, and it didn't use pressure or manipulation or any of that stuff, because I was averse to that. When I tell the story in short form, people think, oh, well, he must be a slick, fast-talking, whatever. Not the, not the case. I was very insecure, very shy, very all kinds of things. But I knew this, and so I, I, I sort of wrapped myself in the Scriptures and stuck to whatever I thought God was you know, showing me in the Scripture. And telling the truth, by the way, meant not only saying things that are truthful, but you can tell the truth and still convey a lie. People do it all mm -hmm. the time. Like I, 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 as an example, I'll say, you know, back in whatever year it was, I was invited to speak at the in the Indian, no, excuse me, I don't say that. To make my point, I'll say, you know, Indianapolis has the RCA Dome. It's changed its name, but whatever it was, they had a Promise Keepers meeting there with 60,000 men. And I was honored to speak at that event. Wow. Yep. Yep. Now, I was up on the bleachers. Nobody could really hear me. <laughs> so, yep. so what happens is in business, people a lot of times, dishonest folks will leave out certain points and say, well, I never actually lied. Well, you did because the definition of lying is the intent to deceive. So I said, okay, Lord, how do I walk this out? And those are the things I do. And by the way, I finished the year at about 90 some odd percent and a closing rate set a record and all that. They made me the sales manager and they wanted to know if it was transferable. In other words, because people would say this to me, Kevin, they say, oh, he's, he's from Mars or something. We don't understand this guy. Because I didn't do what they wanted me to. I didn't play the games. I didn't do the pressure stuff. I abhorred it. I didn't do any of the stuff that they, they, you know, that's commonly done. And yet my sales were like this. So when they gave me my own team of five guys, 10 months later, my team was up 430%. And they said, that's hmm. enough of you being a sales manager. You're not a trainer for the entire company. But what happened, the short story is, I led several of them to Christ. And they say, yeah. follow me as I follow him. Let me show you how we do this. We don't that's use right. the pressure. We don't use the manipulation. We don't do that. God has a way. If you want to learn his ways and apply his ways, you can do far better. And the reason, and I'll stop with this, the reason I wanted yeah. to do well when I took that job, I said, Lord, I know that when somebody does well in something, excels, people kind of want to emulate them, follow them, whatever. But if I go in there as a Christian and I'm a witness, you want to witness to people, but I'm floundering in my job, they won't, won't want to hear anything I've got to say. So I want to do well. Help me to do well so I can give glory and credit to you. That's right. And, many too. and so I think that's an important part, and that's what I did. That that's incredible. I mean, I, I love the whole story of it, Michael. And even the fact that you're quoting, like you said, Proverbs 3, that you're saying, you know what, Lord, here's what I found. What does it look like to bind mercy and truth around my neck? And then really, as you're talking about, if they don't need something, then I shouldn't be trying to sell them something. Right. And then from there, I'm going to commit to be truthful in that. When you, I'm curious, when you started training your team and then eventually nationally, would you go back to Proverbs 3 with them? Or how did you do that? It depends, okay. Uh, when when I, I've spoken at uh, you know lots of places, a lot of corporations, and sometimes they 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 you know don't want me to bring Bible verses into it and so forth. Uh, an example was an international insurance company, life insurance company, I was outside of the United States. That's all I'm going to say about them. And they invited me to come and do some training for their life insurance agents in two of the countries. Uh, one of them had. Um, 
uh, I'm trying to get the, the numbers correct. Uh, one I think had, uh, I have to think about it. I think it was around 60 uh, agents. The other one had 30, something to that effect, whatever the numbers were, very close. No, it was 45 and 30. That was it. I had to think through that a bit. And uh, so I asked the president, he was a Christian, and he said, yeah, Michael, uh, they're Christian, but I mean, I'm a Christian, but most of these guys aren't. I said, okay. Now listen, I pray before I do these things. I said, Lord, what do you, and, and I was going to this country, I said, Lord, what do you want to accomplish? Because I want to be in sync with what you're trying to do. And what I felt like he said to me is he wanted to start a fire there. And I said, a fire? What do you mean? You mean you want me to, what do you want me to do? They made it clear, don't give Bible verses and all this kind of stuff. So I get there and I tell the president, I said, you know, I've ne and it's true, I'd never done this before, but I said, I, I think God wants me to give an invitation to your salespeople to receive Christ when I'm finished. Would that be okay? And he thought about it. He said, well, I guess so. So at the end of the day, I did doing a day of training and teaching these things, initially minus the Bible verses, but people could pick up on where I was at and then kind of weaving things in. Get to the end of the day, I told a story, a powerful, powerful story about a glove, which is on my blog, but it's, it's, it's a story basically talks about salvation. True story. And I said, does anybody, if anybody here wants to know what it's like to have Jesus Christ come inside them and live in them, I would like to pray with you, you know, over here, you know, basically one-on-one. -on -one. And so then the president comes up because it's the end of the day. He said, well, thank you very much, Michael. Been a great day of training. Okay, everybody. Monday morning, we got a sales meeting at, you know, eight o'clock. Don't forget to bring your receipts and your travel expenses, blah, blah, blah. In other words, nobody was playing just as I am. Yeah. Right? <laughs> And then he said, <laughs> yep. if anybody wants Michael to pray with him, he'll be right over here. You're dismissed. Have a great weekend. Here's what happened without any exaggeration. The 45 people, men and women in that room, stood up like one person, and every single person came forward, everyone, for individual mm -hmm. prayer to receive Christ, everyone. When it was finished, the president was sitting on the front row crying like a baby. The camera crew that they hired, just some vendor in that country, came up to me afterwards and said, can, can I do that too? He wanted to get that in on that as well. And then we went to the next country two days later, and exactly the same thing happened with everybody in the room uh, coming forward. And I'd never done that before, but that's where you're, you're, you're bringing Jesus into the equation. And, yeah. and, you know, I don't do it without the invitation, without the feeling that the, the sense that the Spirit is leading me in a certain way. You know, I mean, I, I'm that's human, right. you're human. Yeah. We try to follow God as best we know how. But I'm not afraid. I'm not ashamed. Yeah. But I and I try to walk uh, in wisdom, but also walk by His leading. So. Well, I tell you, Michael. Even in hearing your stories, I walk away from this conversation with the renewed, a renewed, a great reminder about what it looks like for the Holy Spirit to live within you and out of you. Whether you're selling copiers, whether you're involved in real estate whether you're involved in business, whether you're leading a ministry or a nonprofit like I am, whatever you're doing, like, Lord, how do you, how can you use me right now? And so I love what you shared. I'm walking away with Proverbs 3, binding mercy and truth around your neck, what that looks like. Um, I know that people are listening. I hope that people listening involved in business or sales um, are, are gleaning from you as well. Where can they hear more from you? I mean, I know you've written some things. How can people hear more from you then, Michael? Well, my invitation is, is to go to Michael Pink. Dot com. Michael is M-I-C-H-A-E-L. Michael Pink, like the color, dot com. And I would urge you to get a hold of my new series of books called God's Best Kept Secrets. God's Best Kept Secrets. It's 40 years of distilled wisdom put down into a book form where I felt like God was telling me to put as much as you can into this, no strings attached, and make it available to as many people as possible. You don't make money on books. I've sold hundreds of thousands of my books. That's not where you make yeah. money. Um, yeah. and, and, and so the books, they're a, they're a package, but they're like $15 a piece, but they come in a package. So, you know, it's not a yeah. big expense and it's not a money-making thing, but it is a way of releasing this. We touched on, I think two things here, maybe three. I got 101 that I put in yeah. the books. And so there's yeah. so much that is there. I would urge them to go to michaelpink.com. Help yourself and reach out to me if you care to know more. I love it. Well, Michael, again, I appreciate the time. It's so good to hear about a guy who's passionately following Jesus in the midst of selling copiers or whatever it is you're doing. Like, Lord, how can you use me? So thanks for being here to share a few minutes of wisdom today. I sure appreciate it. Kevin, it's been my honor. You made it easy. Thank you, my friend. 
Hey, thanks for listening to this episode of Following to Lead. Uh, be sure to check out our show notes. Uh, we're always in putting in there links to resources in there, so make sure you check those out. Or you can find them on our website at followingtolead.com. Hey, uh, if you want to ever catch up with me personally, connect with me on Instagram at Kevin T. East or on Facebook. Or you can even find our Following to Lead with Kevin's Facebook site there as well. We're always posting uh, fun resources there as well. Hey, uh, let me leave you these last four words as I always do. Follow Jesus. Lead different.